And welcome. A number of years ago I did a video called All About the French Horn Part 1 and I promised an All About the French Horn Part 2 but I have never actually done it until today. Welcome to this video All About the French Horn Part 2. Before we get into the meat of this video I'd like to take a moment to thank this video sponsor Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform where you can take classes to learn a new skill or develop something that you already know. I'm personally using the platform to improve some of my video creation courses as well as dive deeper into topics that interest me, such as taking this class on Making Vegan Cheese by Christina Ng. But if you're not interested in vegan cheese, you may, however, be interested in modern tapestry weaving by taking this class by Kelly Mac Design. Skillshare has literally thousands and thousands of classes about pretty much everything. As it's online, learning will happen at a time that suits you and will fit perfectly into your schedule, enable you to learn and develop at your own convenience. Even better, an annual premium membership is less than $10 per month. And if, you, and if you're one of the first 1,000 people to use the link in the video description, you will get a free trial. So get started today. In part one, I talked about uh, some of the characteristics of the French horn. And today I'm going to be talking about the different types of horns you can get and some of the variations between horns. Because in reality, there are a bajillion, a metric bajillion types of horns that you can get. But let's start off with the name, French horn. That's what we call it in English. Uh, but it's a bit of a misnomer because the French horn isn't actually French. A lot of the development happened in Germany. It seems to be only English uh, speaking countries that refer to this as the French horn. The correct name for this instrument is just horn. But that's not particularly a majestic sounding name. So we uh, persist and calling it French horn. The first sort of horn that I want to mention is the natural horn, uh, also known as the horn. And it is basically just loops of tubing with a mouthpiece at one end, a bell at the other, and just loops in here. There were no valves, there were no real ways to change the pitch other than by using your lips and blocking off the airflow with your hand uh, inside the bell. Talk about that more in the previous video, so go and make sure you watch that. If you wanted to change the overall pitch of your instrument, you would have to add or remove extra loops of tubing, and that would change your scale. Uh, and that's just what people had to do before valves were invented. Next we have single horns. In the mainstream world there are two different sizes of these. We have low F and B flat as being the predominant choice. F horns being lower have, tend to have a better lower and mid range, but B flat horns tend to take over and become better into the higher ranges. B flat horns, because they are uh, have less tubing in them, they tend to be lighter and can be made a little bit smaller, so some people prefer them uh, as a beginner instrument. However, the downside of the B flat horn is that it misses some of the very low notes and it has a tone that's a little bit more akin to that of a trombone, so it doesn't have that sort of rich warmth that the F horn is known for. One of the problems with single horns is that the music that you read doesn't care what sort of horn you're playing. So if you're a person who's reading a piece of music on an F horn, you're pushing down different fingers to a person that's playing the same music on a B flat horn. So if you want to go between the two, you have to learn two completely separate, uh, two completely separate sets of fingering. There are a couple of unusual single horns that are pitched in high F and even high B flat. They're not really mainstream equivalents, but they take the advantage of the B flat horn being better in the higher range and sort of take that to the next level. Uh, you miss low ranges, you have a different tone that sort of sounds a bit brighter and lacks some of the warmth, uh, but you can get the high notes quite effectively on those instruments. 
This here is a single horn in B flat. Uh, it has three valves as we can see, they're actuated by the left hand. It is fairly small, fairly light as far as things go. Some uh, B flat horns have a fourth valve called a stopping valve. This would be actuated by your thumb and there would be a fourth valve usually that sits here. Hand stopping is a technique whereby you use your hand, which is rummaging up the bell, to completely block the airflow of the instrument. Normally when you use your hand in your French horn, you're partially blocking the airflow, and that can take the pitch and lower it slightly. But when you completely block the airflow, uh, you actually raise the pitch. On an F horn, that raises the pitch by about a semitone, so you can compensate and bring that pitch down by fingering everything a semitone flat. On a B flat horn, however, when you completely block the airflow, you tend to raise the pitch by three quarters of a tone. And it's very difficult to do anything to bring that back into tune. So, some B flat horns have this fourth valve, the stopping valve, and that lowers the overall pitch of the instrument by three quarters of a tone. So, stopping the instrument, brings the pitch up by three quarters of a tone, pressing the stopping valve, lowers it back down so it's in tune. Hand stopping is a useful technique, and I'm not really going to go into techniques too much, but it gives the French horn that really sort of almost nasally, raspy sound uh, that some composers like to utilise. This here is a double horn. This is a sort of horn that combines the benefits of the F horn and the benefits of the B flat single horn into one simple instrument. So this horn differs in that we've got two sets of tuning slides. The valves on this instrument, which um, there's no way I can really conveniently show it, but the valves of this instrument are twice as deep and each valve has two sets of tuning slides. We have the F side up the top and around the back we have the B flat side which is a little bit shorter. Double horns combine the benefits of having an F horn with its powerful and warm low and mid range with a B flat horn and the improvements that that brings in the upper range. Most orchestral musicians or people that play the French horn regularly will choose a double horn in most situations because the advantages that it brings having that uh, additional range security and the intonation and the alternate fingering options outweigh the disadvantages brought by the additional weight. Double horns will have a fourth valve that is actuated by your thumb and the fourth valve in this particular horn is offset up to the right because it's a crispy style wrap but there are also different ways that the tubing can be arranged where you would have the fourth valve in line over here and that's called a Gaia wrap. The two different wraps have different playing characteristics. Gaia wraps tend to be a little bit more open, they have less bends and, twi uh, and twists, they also tend to have a smaller bell that results in a brighter sounding horn whereas crusty wraps like this one have uh, a few more bends, twists and turns in them, they tend to have a larger bell, they tend to sound a little bit darker uh, and they tend to be what players tend to prefer. Some double horns will combine their standard four valves with a stopping valve, so the B flat side of the horn will also have a stopping valve and that will give you a fifth valve to play with. Often the fifth valve will be a second thumb trigger uh, and so that gives you a horn that has the ability to play in tune on the B flat side whilst hand stopping. Uh, but again, it adds more weight to the instrument, so whether or not you want that is going to be entirely down to your preferences. There's a variation to the double horn called a descant horn, and that's similar to the double horn, but instead of having your low F and B flat sides, instead you've got your B flat and high F sides. It takes the concept of a French horn and just raises it up slightly, um, so you get the advantages in your very high range, you've got a lot of solidity down there, but you don't have the depth, you don't have the warmth of having that larger French horn to play. Uh, but if you're a person who plays predominantly high-pitched uh, high music, then it'll be the instrument for you. The next type of horn to talk about is the compensating horn. Now this is sort of halfway between a single horn and a double horn. It has both the ability to play in F and B flat, but with a double horn where the F and B flat sides are completely separate and you switch between the two with a fourth valve, 
On a compensating horn you've got your B flat side and then to play an F you've got a set of additional tuning slides that you add on top of the B flat side. So you've got some advantages in terms of uh, reduced size, reduced weight, uh, so it's suitable then for a younger person. But in order to play on your F side, you're having to blow through two sets of tuning slides. And that adds some stuffiness, that adds some additional resistance. I've actually got an unusual compensating horn up here, which I've talked about in previous videos. The next sort of horn is a triple horn. Now this takes the double horn and adds an extra side to it. So on a double horn, you've got your low F and your B flat sides. On a triple horn you'll have your low F, your B flat and your high F sides. And the reason for having that high F uh, is that it gives you even more strength up high. Now this obviously is a very expensive instrument. It is also quite heavy and quite large. But if you're a player that needs to be able to play the full range of your instrument, then it is what some people like. There are all the common types of horns that you get, but even within those groups themselves, there are a lot of variations. I talked about the Crusby and Gaia wraps for double horns. Well, that's not where it ends. You also have things like removable bells. This double horn doesn't have a removable bell. Therefore, to transport this around, it's quite an odd shape. The case is quite big. The single horn, on the other hand, does have a removable bell. So I can take the end of this and remove it. In the case, these sort of lie flat next to each other, so it is a much smaller instrument, uh, much more convenient to pack around. This horn here has mechanical linkages on it, which means that the levers that you press to actuate the valves and the rotation of the valves themselves are physically and mechanically attached to each other with a metal linkage. The alternative to this is a string linkage, where you have a loop of string wrapped around these in such a way that it gives you control over the valve. Uh, there's schools of thought as to which one is better, but they really do come down to personal preference. French horns also tend to have an absence of water keys. Uh, you'll notice on the back of this French horn I don't have any spit valves or water keys, and it's exactly the same with my double horn. So if this thing gets water, which it does because it's a brass instrument, what I have to do to get the water out of it is either rotate it until that water either comes out the bell or the mouthpiece, or I have to remove tuning slides and sort of dump the water that way. There is a school of thought that suggests that having water keys on a French horn, because the tubing is so much narrower than any other instrument, having a water key on the French horn uh, introduces turbulence and internal uh, stresses and things like that that degradate the quality of the sound. Uh, but frankly, this is the 21st century. There are types of water keys that impede almost non-existently into the flow of air through the instrument. So frankly, I just think the French horn players, uh, French horn manufacturers need to catch up with the rest of the world. Give us water keys on our French horns, ridiculous. French horns traditionally have rotary valves, which as the name suggests, are valves which rotate. That's not the only option, however. If you were to be a French horn player or a horn player in Vienna, you would have a horn that has Vienna valves or pumpin' valves. These are the sort of valves that you can see uh, on uh, this instrument over here, where you have two shafts per valve and you have a mechanism at the bottom that opens both of them simultaneously. So they have sort of six valve barrels and, and a different sort of valve mechanism effectively. Uh, so there are different ways that valves actuate, but the predominant type is these rotary valves here. In addition to French horns that look like French horns, there are also a family of instruments, or families of instruments, that take some characteristics of the French horn, but hybrid them, make hybrid mutations with other instruments. You can get marching French horns, which are French horns that project forward. You don't rummage your hand up the bell, uh, and you often play them with piston valves, and they're used for the marching field. You also have instruments like the frumpet, which is this one up here, and that is a hybrid of a French horn and a trumpet, taking the worst of each and smushing them together to create an abomination. 
In addition, you could have a thing like this, which is a King Altonium. This doesn't look anything like a French horn, but it takes a French horn sized mouthpiece, it has a French horn bore, and it's the same key as the French horn. So it's a hybrid effectively of an E flat alto or tenor horn and a French horn. Why this exists, I don't know, but you know, they exist. In addition to that, we've got things like the mellophone, the mellophonium, and the tenor core, which are all instruments that copy some attributes of the French horn and uh, create hybrid instruments with that. So, I hope you have learned something. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I do apologise that it's been around three years since part one and part two of this series, but I hope you can forgive me for that. Thank you very much for watching.